All right, trying to figure out the camera here. Just waiting for Myrna to let me know if I have the right angle or not. Having some trouble with it this morning. One day I'm going to get this right and it's going to be less of a problem and I'm going to be so excited. So it's Thursday and it's a great morning over here so far. Um, things have been quiet, there's lots of coffee. And we apparently have the camera set up on the second try. I'm so excited right now. <laughs> um, one day I'm going to get this right, right out of the gate and it's going to be amazing. I'm really looking forward to that day. I feel like I'm going to have to get myself an extra cookie. Um, I'm not a technologically adept person. Um, there's a reason that I still draw everything, uh, with pen and paper. So, yeah. Um, I guess we're going to do a little bit more of that today. So the picture that you're seeing in front of you is the almost finished colored version of an inn called the Salmon Spyglass that I'm working on for a commission. Um, this commission is to... Uh, bring together a gaming module that introduces children to the game. I think it's being geared at ages 9 to 13, if I remember correctly. Um, and so I've agreed to contribute four different pieces for this. Uh, one of them was the town map uh, for the town of Runda that surrounds the Luminous Lake. Uh, this is the final image for the Salmon Spyglass, which is the inn that the adventurers will go to to gain information. Uh, there's also a little tower. And the thumbnail sketch that I was doing for the Druid study um, two, three weeks ago now um, is the last piece which hasn't been finished yet. Um, I apologize for the break in live streams. Things were just getting a little chaotic for me with being away from home. And then unfortunately I had a terrible tooth problem. And I don't know if it's happened to anyone else, but coloring, or sorry, talking when you have a molar that feels like you have a dagger in your face is just really not pleasant. So I thought I'd spare everyone <laughs> because it seemed like the generous thing to do. Um, so I'm going to work on this today. Um, just try to get the depth of the coloring finished up. And um, if we get some time out of that, then I want to start mapping out uh, the map around Invictus, which is the main city for my novel, um, because I'm planning on that being the map for my Patreon this month. So... Um, one of the things that I want to pay attention to with this is the sense of depth because this is meant to be um, balconies that are recessed back from the street and I want to make sure that that's showing properly. So it's showing me in the camera that there's a little bit of shadow that you can see in some of the places that I've put up. Like there's a bar of it here under the edge of the roof and little curves here. Um, but it's not as strong as I want it to be. So we're going to go in and just keep adding to that. Um, you can see there's a lot more dimensionality happening on the tops of the posts and on the shingles. And that's because there's actually, I think, four colors of brown in there to kind of create that illusion. Um, and right now there's just two colors on what are meant to be the plaster parts of the inn. So we're going to keep working on that. Um, one of the ways that I match colors is to create a little batch like this um, to kind of put things beside each other and figure out do I like how this looks, is it too much the same, um, is it different enough, does it harmonize. Uh, Copic has a really great system and that's what I'm using, sorry are the Copic markers. Um, will it focus? Can you focus? Maybe? No? Um, but they have a really great system that uses a letter-number combination that works together to give you information about how the colors are going to fit together. So if you're dealing with the E family, it's all going to be within the same color family. If you're dealing with fours, um, it's all going to match up to other fours. Threes are going to match up to other threes, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that I found super useful lately was I finally broke down and bought their color swatch book. Um, which you can make your own, and I've seen so many people do much cooler color swatch books than this. Um, but it just gives you the opportunity to lay out the ones that you own, and then have an example of what the color looks like. Um, so you can flip through it instead of looking at the caps and going, oh yeah, what does that actually look like on the page again? 
Um, I feel a little bit like I'm playing bingo <laughs> when I'm putting these in. Uh, it's really satisfying to get a line. Um, and there, I've got one page that's completely filled in, this one. And it just makes me feel very accomplished for some reason. Um, so yeah, when I was going through and working on the Salmon Spyglass, I specifically was looking at this page and going like, which shades of brown do I have? And how do they work together uh, in terms of of flow so that I was making fewer errors with that. Um, it's still nice to randomly combine them and see what effect you get, but this really speeds up my process and I'm glad that I took the time and the effort to make that happen for me. So, um, one of the things that I know I need, oh, sorry, I'm gonna try not to knock that box too much because it is a little bit noisy, um, is just to have my little color swatches available to me here. And this uh, E81 Ivory is the color that I was using, and I've already created a bit of a shadow there, so I'm just going to go back in and kind of darken it a little bit and fade it out. So one of the things that I want to be careful of is I don't want to take this color over these darker brown beams. Um, Copics are alcohol-based markers, and one of the things that they can do because they're alcohol-based is they can have a lighter color push out a darker color from within an area. And that's really an amazing thing about them. I really like it, um, especially like when you're making errors. Um, you can usually go back in with a lighter color and kind of clean them up, which isn't something that I've ever really been able to do with a different style of marker. Um, but it also means that you could end up going back and forth in an area um, and damage what you're working on if you're not paying attention to your edges. So I don't know if it's easy to see, but there's a little bit of area here where my red has gone over the edge of this um, window cell. So like that will eventually push itself out now that I've added the extra marker to it. So yeah, I'm just gonna go in and kind of darken these up a little bit which will make this shadow just a little bit more subtle. Or not, sorry, a little bit more obvious, not subtle. I've had my coffee, I swear. And then I'll go back in and continually darken the parts that are the farthest back from the light source. And that should give us the same kind of dimensionality that I have on the posts. This project has been so much fun to work on. Um, I love drawing for children. Um, there's just something that is really fantastic about how enthusiastic kids get about new experiences. Um, realized I'm saying I'm a lot. Sorry, guys. And just their enthusiasm for things like color um, and just their own sense of adventure, especially that for role playing games is is so cool to watch. There's no real restriction on what they think is possible at certain ages. So there's no real, well, that couldn't possibly happen the way that you sometimes get with adults who are playing role-playing games. Um, in fact, I find it to be the opposite. Kids have a tendency to be like, well, you know, this is absolutely not plausible in the confines of reality. However, there's nothing in the rules saying we can't, so why not have a 200-foot rubber clip that is a paper clip that we use to span this gap and turn it into a bridge? I mean, that's absolutely a thing we can do. And it really gives me a better appreciation for out-of-the-box thinking, um, listening to someone who doesn't really realize that there's supposed to be a box. I'm also really for having children in gaming because it teaches a lot of interpersonal skills. Um, and I realize that perhaps sounds a little odd to some of the people who have had negative experiences within the gaming community. I've certainly been one of those people. Um, but I didn't, as much as it was difficult to be within certain gaming groups because they weren't maybe as, uh, socially aggressive or as inclusive as I was, it didn't stop me loving the games. Um, and it didn't take away my desire to participate. It took away some of the options for my participation. Um, and it taught me how to better advocate for myself and how to find the people that were actually going to be my tribe. Um, and I think that is a very, very important 
skill to have, especially as a kid. Like, sometimes school and just life in general, it, it's harder as a child. And I think as we grow up, we lose track of, of how new and how immediate everything is. Um, and therefore how stressful in some ways. And I think having role-playing experience gave me more opportunities to learn how to manage that. Because um, I was being put into these fictional hypothetical situations where I needed to have a solution. And I needed to be able to cooperate with these people around me that I maybe didn't necessarily like, but like we were depending on each other. Um, and it gave me the ability to, to learn how to practice doing that a lot more than I think my other peers who weren't gaming at the time got the chance to do it. Which I think is just incredibly valuable. Getting along is probably the hardest thing to do in our society and it's the bedrock of it. And the more we teach people how to do it in a way that's productive and in hopefully um, based on empathy and, and a genuine desire to connect with people as opposed to just, hey, you're useful and I'm going to use you to achieve my own ends. Um, which is an unfortunately common attitude in gaming. Uh, the better off I think we're going to be as a society. Um, and I just realized I'm advocating D&D as a metric for social change, which I guess I am. I, I'm not ashamed of that. I think anything that helps us learn how to work together better is never going to be a bad thing. So yeah, I'm excited to be part of this module. I hope that I get to do more work like this. Um in the future. I, you just get to use so much more fun colors when you're working with kids. And I love the rounded style of the drawings that I do for this. Um, it's really just a pile of fun in terms of clever and cheekiness without it needing to be as serious perhaps as what we do uh, when I'm creating for adults. And you always need a little bit of room for fun in your life, right? <laughs> That's the thing. Okay, so what other color do we need here? Maybe this one? That shadow is starting to look a lot better. I'm glad for that. That's good. I've been thinking about a lot, like, what feeds into our stereotypes of what a proper fantasy inn looks like. Uh, and I think we're heavily influenced by the lathe and plaster looks that have gone on in older European settings. Um, because a lot of us have inherited our, our fairy tale and fictional makeup from those particular cultures. I think it's interesting how even when you haven't, um, the genre has supported that. So people who didn't grow up with a Western European or Eastern European background still kind of identify this particular stereotype as being the stereotype, the definitive um, metric for it. And that's cool because it helps create the shared experience in a role playing situation, which is always good, I think. Um, but it's also just really interesting because there's a precipice now with wanting to respect cultural appropriation and, and not be that person that takes advantage of someone else's culture strictly for entertainment. Um, that also in some ways I think is perhaps limiting some of the options when it comes to gaming. Um, because it's so much more difficult to draw for a fantasy setting uh, on things that are not your own culture and do it properly and do it respectfully. Um, so we end up falling back on, on what we know and what we have access to, culturally speaking. I don't think there's anything wrong with that fallback position. Um, I think also just we can't underestimate how much work it is to set up a game, um, especially for people who homebrew their own worlds. That's a ton of work. Um, it is an absolute load of work and anybody who doesn't really understand that is unfortunately doing their game DMs and stuff a huge disservice. Um, because they're just not, not getting a proper grip on what an effort it is to actually put that all together. But I think, 
I think it would be fun to find more inns that don't look like this outside of a really high fantasy, high magic setting. Um, and I wonder what they would look like. I had a really big debate about like what color to make the trim for this inn. Like, did I want to go with something more classic like the red? Um, and I can't remember culturally where that comes from. Bavaria, maybe? I'd have to look up my reference again. Uh, or would I want to try and, you know, do purple or do something slightly more fantastic? And all of the color swatches that I tried were not as convincing to me. Um, probably because of that cultural inheritance, even though I'm dealing with a fantasy setting. So, I found that part of the process really interesting just for myself. Okay, I think that is starting to look really, really good in terms of the shadow. Mm. I think it also matters what level of magic you're dealing with um, in a society as to what an audience's tolerance for unconventional color is going to be. Um, we have kind of an unspoken expectation that high magic settings are going to have less probable color um, because magic somehow makes that more permissible or easier to deal with. And I find that interesting. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I think sometimes it reflects uh, a more realistic economy where dyes are still super expensive and paints and pigments, for example. Um, but I wonder why. <laughs> like, I really do. I think that's just an interesting, interesting kind of assumption to be making. I was listening to... Uh, the Web DM, which is a series on YouTube, uh, a really fantastic series. If you guys have never checked it out, I suggest that you do. Uh, if you're interested in the details of playing 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons or um, kind of the lore and, and makeup of those worlds, Pruitt and Jim Davis are just incredibly knowledgeable and they have great conversations that kind of range everywhere in terms of like world building and how to set up an encounter, but also motivations, um, not just of DMs and players, but also of like monsters and social entities that you're going to encounter. And they were doing an episode on high magic versus low magic settings. I'll see if I can find the link. I'll make myself a note to do that. Um, that I found really interesting and thought-provoking for me. Note achieved. Um, and part of the reason why I find it so interesting is I'm doing a lot of reading right now. I tend to go through cycles that are reading versus writing uh, for the novel that I'm working on. And right now I'm reading... Uh, the Outlander by Diana Gobaldon. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly or not. Um, which is a high fantasy, kind of portal fantasy. She falls through a ring of standing stones in Scotland and leaves, I think it's 1942 and ends up 200 years earlier. Um, but there's no real magic. Like, there's... A magical lore there's a magical um, tradition in terms of like people believe in the rural areas that there might be fairies um, there's superstitions about elves and uh, water horses like the Loch Ness monster um, and so you're not dealing with wizards necessarily who can cast fireball or you know levitate uh, things like that and it's interesting, like normally I'm a high fantasy reader. If I'm gonna do escapist reading, I want to <laughs> have the maximum possible escape, I suppose. So it's been interesting to find a world, because uh, I've never really looked for one before, that is so engrossing 
uh, in terms of character personality and plot. Uh, and it really, this is a very character-driven narrative. If you're not there for the characters, if you don't care for them, I don't think that you'd probably like the book all that much. Um, that deals in a, a fantasy low magic setting. So I'm enjoying it. Um, I understand that there are a lot of a lot of books in the series, which is honestly pretty exciting for me. Uh, I really, really enjoy um, extensive si uh, series with a lot of world building. Um, and especially if the series has already progressed quite a bit, it's nice because then I'm less feeling like I don't have uh, things to go to when I want to be reading and haven't found a new book, for example. I think I think most of the world knows the pain of waiting for the next Harry Potter to come out because you're just really invested in that world and it was good to have that anticipation but also, oh my goodness, why the wait, why the wait kind of thing. I think for a lot of people that's more common with television now. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV so that's less of a struggle for me but I sometimes have a hard time getting out of my reading rut or finding something else that is going to catch my attention. Which is silly. There are so many books out there. We were talking in a reading group that I'm part of on Facebook about how long you give a book not catching your attention before you decide, no, I don't want to deal with this anymore. It's not worth it and put it down. And I realized that I really struggle with putting a book down, like if it's, even if it's disappointing me and I absolutely hate it, I will still do my best to kind of soldier on to the end and, and get through it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily. I think it's important to read things that you don't immediately like because it keeps expanding your bubble, um, of what is out in the world. And I think we're, we're improved every time we realize that the world is not limited to our own perspective and our own state of being. But it can be challenging um, to be faced either with ideas that you're uncomfortable with, um, especially if you're not prepared to kind of dissect them and do the labor of figuring out why you're uncomfortable with them. Um, and I think also sometimes like just writing style is an issue for me. If I don't have a lot of time to read, I don't necessarily want to be spending that time um, putting up with a writing style that doesn't appeal, if that makes any sense. So, I'm trying to read things that are a little bit out of my comfort zone to keep me engaged and actively thinking about the process instead of just brain candy is a great thing. I think that's one of the biggest benefits to the education that I got in terms of like English in high school. Is we read a lot of things that I would not have otherwise have read. And some of those pieces have really, really lingered with me. Um, just giving me different thoughts to have. Um, I think, I don't know how it is for curriculums in other places, but I grew up in Alberta, Canada, and I think pretty much everyone my age had to read books like 1984, uh, which is powerful. It is such an incredibly powerful novel. It's not easy. I, I, I don't think it's a reading for pleasure kind of book in the slightest. But it, it is definitely something that informs a worldview, and I think understanding how that happens is huge. Um, worldview is a really big deal if you're writing fantasy settings, or even like nonfiction work. Understanding where someone's biases come into play is pretty huge. Um, I'm trying to write a novel right now, and in some ways writing a novel is a lot like creating a world for a role-playing game and I've had the temptation of trying to become a dungeon master within my own world setting like running it as a homebrew game um, I started actually setting up a Facebook group and stuff to make that happen um, last year and then the patreon and everything kind of got kicked up and I've been busy a lot more with commissions so it hasn't had time to get off the ground but thinking a lot about what kind of encounters do I want my players to have, what kind of encounters do I want my characters in the book to have, gives me a lot to chew on in terms of like, is this going to be a political encounter? Do they need to work on diplomacy roles or bluff checks? Um, what kinds of skills come into play 
when we're dealing with that kind of thing? Is this a physical encounter where they're dealing with some kind of actual physical threat that's going to require a martial ability or maybe a magical one? Are there situations where there's no win, like the Kobayashi Maru kind of thing? And I think a good writer and a good DM takes those things well into account while they're creating and I think that you can tell when someone has taken them well into account. Um, things don't feel so haphazard, and there's a tendency to be able to build them up into something greater farther down the line. Um, which is an interesting conversation, uh, especially within gaming circles, about the idea of uh, sandbox games versus railroading games. Um, I think railroading is a terrible term. Um, I think it should be reserved for kind of, I don't know, derogatory is the wrong word, but situations where your DM really isn't giving you options as opposed to a campaign where the DM has chosen a particular storyline and format and world building uh, metric that has been pre-agreed to. I think that's the important part of it, um, that people are, are following that particular storyline. I find it interesting that there's such vitriol against it, given that Wizards of the Coast spends their time producing direct play modules, right? Like the Rise of Tiamat for 5e was a direct play module. There was all kinds of quest lines and stories and activities that you could play through and lead your characters through. But, you know, there wasn't deliberately any room in there for improvisation because they wanted you to follow the story as was written. Um, as opposed to perhaps maybe a sandbox game where you just put a map in front of your players and say, here, go, um, tell me where you want to be and I will make that happen for you. That was the style of game I was hoping to play um, for Halcyon. Um, I really wanted what's called a West Marches style campaign, which is driven uh, by players. Sorry, just coffee. Um, and so the idea is you start in one location on a map and you go west from there, um, or whichever direction you're going to, and you see what's up on the map. Like your players have a look at what's in front of them and they say, oh, I'm really interested in this area. Um, can we go and explore there? Or I'm not interested in that. I don't want to do it. What about going over here? And there tends to be a pool of players, like a large pool, um, more than your standard adventuring party. And your players get together and decide where they want to go and what they want to do. And your cast of characters can shift depending on if players are interested in doing that or not interested in doing that. And I like that because it's really a heavy player investment style of gaming. So you don't have people sitting at the table who are on their phones or otherwise mentally checked out because they really want to be there. Uh, the whole point of this for them is, oh man, I'm super excited about this tower that's on the map. I want to go see if it's a wizard's tower. I want to go see what it is because, you know, maybe we can take it over. Maybe we can turn that into our stronghold. And I love the idea of players being super into a game because I'm somebody who gets super into a game. And if you're going to world build, particularly um, if you're homebrewing, you want people who are just as excited about being in your setting as you were about creating it. And there's just so much detail that you have the opportunity to share when you're homebrewing that, I mean, you can make it up for modules like the Rise of Tiamat as well. There's nothing saying that you can't by any means. Um, but homebrews in particular give you the option of being like, and this is what, this is what you're seeing that you've never seen before. And it's more work, but it's also just so much fun. At least that is my opinion. So. I like it a lot. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, I would love to DM. I really, really would. Um, it's a time investment for sure. Um, I have the opportunity to do it. Um, part of it is I don't know with just where I'm living that I necessarily have the kind of players that are interested in my game. And I think that's important to know. Um, I know that I am someone who prefers to emphasize story over 
being really crunchy about the rules. Um, I will absolutely, like, f roll if I think it's going to make for a better encounter. And that's not something that some players appreciate uh, or desire in their gaming experience. Some of them really want something to be a lot more um, consistent and focused is probably the wrong word. But, you know, the gritty realism aspect of things. And I'm less for the gritty realism of stuff and more for the psychological experience of the encounter. So... I love the people that I'm playing with. I absolutely do. They're awesome. Uh, however, I do not think that that's a thing that they care about uh, to the same extent that I care about it. So, uh, knowing your audience, I guess, if you're running a game <laughs> is a pretty big one. Color grass, do we want you guys? Hmm. What does that look like down there? I think that's too dark. That's okay as a shadow, but I don't think I want that as grass. I think part of it is I came out of a gaming tradition uh, where my first games were LARPs. And they were heavily psychological LARPs. Uh, and by the time you were done playing, you had this really intimate sense of the other people that you had played with. Like, there was a lot of leaning into difficult topics and difficult conversations and it just it's an interesting form of intimacy that I don't see in a lot of like Dungeons and Dragons style gaming um and I don't think there's anything wrong with that I don't think D&D &D is intended to become like a psychologically intimate experience although I've heard of games that definitely have done that um this one's called grass green let's see if it's the color we want so yeah, I think, no, that's not going to work for this one. I think that knowing your audience is a really big deal. It does kind of make me miss the gaming group that I was in where that was what was going on. Um, just because it's a style of play that I really enjoy and I do miss it. Um, but you know, you are where you are. And you just take it as you got it. I'm just grateful to still be gaming. I didn't expect that we would be, um, once we got out here, the base that we're living on is quite small, and I had no idea kind of what ratio of nerd to army looked like. Um, there's a surprising, surprisingly high number of people in the military, or at least on the base that we're stationed at, who are big into gaming. Like, absolutely huge. Uh, which has been wonderful for me. Um, it's been, made it easier for me to meet people and develop a friend group. And that can be a huge challenge uh, when you're dealing with the military lifestyle. Um, and also just something to do. <laughs> like, we're not in a big town. <laughs> um, there's not a lot of options if you aren't interested in recreation that just doesn't work for me. Or you don't have a lot of money to go out the kind so this has been pretty great in terms of, hey, every Wednesday we're going to get together and we're going to do this thing. And honestly, part of it is it is every Wednesday. Um, one of the eternal struggles of gaming as an adult is life gets in the way. People have kids and they have hobbies and they have, you know, other responsibilities that take up them. But here... There's fewer of those things simply because there's just fewer options to do other stuff. Uh, so what I'm doing right here is this is a bottle of the Copic Colorless Blender um, and a paintbrush. And I'm just going to use this to kind of start blending in some of these background uh, and like more natural elements like the sky and the grass. Um, just to smooth out the texture of them. Uh, I'm really enjoying the effect that this has on blending things out and kind of that watermark look of the edges as the marker pushes them around it kind of just softens up everything that's going on there i did a map in this style the other night 
um, just by accident. It was not anything that I had been intending to do. And I really enjoy it. Um, it gives a much more kind of earnest geography in some ways. Um, that's a strange combination of words, but it's still true. And I just kind of enjoy like the faded kind of white look that it gives to some of the color. I think that'll be particularly pleasant uh, for the clouds. It just kind of loosens up the tension in the marker line, softening things. The biggest thing is just paying attention to the spread because you don't want it to start interacting with lines that you don't want to have bleed. So as I'm going into this corner by the roof, like I want to make sure I'm not heavy uh, with the amount of fluid on my brush at that point because I don't need that becoming a problem. I think that I'll end up going through a lot more of this fluid now that I know I can do it with a brush. Um, this was a gift from a friend of mine. Oh, I don't want as much in there. Don't do it. Um, who always seems to anticipate where I'm at creatively and always seems to have something in her box of unused supplies to be like, hey, you should play with this. And man, that's a gift. It really, really is. So one of the things to pay attention to when you're working with the coloring fluid like this is that it will push the existing color in your marker out to the edges of wherever your space is wet. Um, and you don't want those lines to end up crowding um, into other areas, which is why I was trying to be more careful over here where the roof is, because um, I don't want those colors to start competing. So, Myrna just asked me what I'm using for my brush and stuff like that. Um, oh, my sketchbook. This sketchbook is a sketchbook that I got at the Canadian craft store Michaels. Um, I think it's from the Dilutions line. Just a second, let me haul that out and I'll check. Um, yeah, so it's made by Ranger. It's part of the Dilutions mixed media. Um, do I have what it's actually called? No, I don't. Um, part of their mixed media line. Uh, Dilutions is spelled D-Y-L-U-S-I-O-N-S. -S, um, and the website for it is www.rangerinc.com. Um, it comes with a super cool label that has this pattern all over it, which I really like. That's why I've kept it. I'm using it for other art supplies uh, as I go. And um, I really like it because the paper is an off-white. It's kind of a cream sort of tan color and it's closer to a cardstock. Like it's quite thick. Um, and so like you get some bleed through when you're dealing with a lot of Copic but I almost never get transferred to the other page. And I've just gone super heavy with this blending fluid. Like that is a saturated page and I'm still good on this side here. Um, the other thing that I really like about it is, let's see if I can show you guys this. The way that the cover is set up, I've never seen on another sketchbook and it was part of what attracted me to it. So you have like your hard cover on the front and it's a heavy cardstock. You open it up and it comes with this 8 by 10 manila envelope. I've added these little pockets just so that I can have like small things that I'm working in a place that's easy for me to find. And then you have the actual sketchbook part. So your binding is here 
um, and it's a flat binding. It's called, what's called a perfect binding. So your page always lays flat, no matter where you are in the book. Um, when I was at the beginning of the book, I had to put something under this side because there is that gap there with the binding, but I didn't find that to be too problematic at all. Um, but then you have each of your pages lays flat while you're working on it. So you're not ever really dealing with that situation where your book is kind of humped over and you don't really, you're not comfortable with the wrist while you're working on it. Um, what I also love about it is like, as you can see, I've been adding a lot of pages in here for maps and stuff that I've already worked on. And that way I have them all in one place. Like I'm, my sketchbooks are also just in part archives of what I've been working on. And it's not always convenient to work in the book itself. Sometimes I need it to be on a separate piece of paper or I didn't have my sketchbook with me at the time. Um, so like, for example, it was more convenient for me to kind of put these pages back to back and save myself like a little bit of room and just paste them into my book than it was to redraw them, um, to have them all in one place. So these, the binding, lets me add pages to the book without blowing out this seam in the middle uh, and making it so that I can't close the book anymore. Uh, I have a wide array of sketchbooks. I've been keeping sketchbooks now for, oh dear God, 20 years, I think. I started doing it when I was a young teenager, like maybe... 12 99 and I have a lot of books that you can't really close <laughs> like they're held together with elastics or tied together with string this is some of that delusion label I was talking about that I've used um and they make them harder to store I mean like they're they're fabulous and they're so full of whatever I've thrown in there um but it does make them harder to store so this one I'm interested to see how it's going to be uh, when it's full, like we're past the halfway point now, I'd say we're at the two thirds point, uh, cause it's still closing quite flat and I'm enjoying that. I think that that's really, really fantastic. So would I buy it again? Yeah, I would. Um, it, if I remember correctly, I, I found it expensive at Michael's, which isn't really a surprise. Um, any Canadian will be able to tell you that art supplies at Michael's are, way more expensive than going to a dedicated art supply shop um, because they're they're geared towards crafters, right? That's their whole their whole deal is they're wanting to provide options for people who want to do crafts, not necessarily fine art, um, which is cool. We need people filling that market. Crafters are awesome. They deserve to do what they do as well. Um, however, they also are like, hey, we can provide people who wouldn't have access to an art supply store because there are more crafters perhaps in certain geographical locations with some art supplies which is great also awesome service to the community um but the markup is intense <laughs> so it was kind of cool to find this book it wasn't intended necessarily for drawing it's for mixed media visual journaling um but it was i think 45 dollars uh, it was the first business purchase I made um, when I was debating going into art full time. And I'm really glad. I'm happy with it. I really am. I think that it has turned out exactly how I want it to. Um, and I think I'd buy them again in a heartbeat. I I like it a lot. I mean, it'll, the rest of that will have to wait on discovering how it functions towards the end of the page set because that's important to know. But. So far, so good. So far, it's a glowing review. All right. So I'm going to let that dry for a little bit. Um, shouldn't take too long. The great thing about the blending fluid is it goes quickly. I don't know if it's easy for you guys to see, but the effect of the edge of the clouds. I'm going to see if I can do this without it being too awkward. Um... I really, really like how this is blended out in here. Like it's just nice and soft compared to some of the harder lines that are the transitions in there. And so right now that looks on the front, but when you step it back, the edges look good. 
So one of the last coloring steps will be to take in um, any gel pens that I want to use to kind of refine edges and clean them up. Um, uh, or any other media that I'm interested in using. I typically tend to stick to Copic and pen uh, when I'm doing stuff that needs to be scanned in. I'm having some difficulty scanning uh, color pencils the way that they show on the page because they're just that little bit reflective and that can cause some problems uh, in terms of what my scanner is picking up versus what is actually there. It's not usually too bad, but I am not a Photoshop wizard <laughs> to know how to fix that kind of thing within Photoshop. I am starting to learn the program, mostly because it makes labeling um, my mapping areas a whole lot smoother and cleaner. Um, than what my hand mapping might come out to. Um, but... I mean, it's it's definitely useful. I'm a little intimidated by it, to be very honest. Uh, it's a complicated program, and like I said at the beginning of this video, um, I'm not really a tech person. It's not my strong point. So... Trying to teach myself things. Um, worth it, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, sorry about the buzz on the phone. That was just a message coming in. All is well over here. It makes sense to ask, though. <laughs> Myrna just messaged me and was like, hey, is this a thing? Because we did have a critical fail on our stream the last time. I thought we had enough battery, and I would have. If we had cut off stream at the normal one hour mark, uh, we would have been fine. But Myrna and I were having way too much fun and decided to go longer. And caused ourselves a little bit of grief that way. Which is fine. That's how it goes. <laughs> Maybe a lesson for me to turn on my do not disturb in the future. So this marker that I'm using right here is a water-based acrylic um, paint pen. I forget the brand. And it doesn't really say. Um, they're kind of in the vein of a Posca paint pen, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, in that they're just really thin acrylic paint, and they're great to work with when you want that kind of intense masking that an acrylic paint will give you, um, that nice bit of flat color to kind of clean up your edges and make things a little bit more tidy. I'm just using it here in the clouds to give a little bit more definition. A few more examples of just kind of where things are lighter or heavier. Refine the curves a little bit. The great thing about using Copic over acrylic is if you go over the acrylic directly, it kind of masks it out a little, um, which gives a really neat kind of effect that's more faded than where the Copic hits directly on the paper. I enjoyed that. That's pretty cool.
attempted to go in. <clears throat> Sorry, doing a lot of thinking in my head, please don't mind me. That's more purple than I want. I wonder if I just don't have the color that I need. Which is sometimes a risk. Nope, that's way too dark. What I'm looking for is just the opportunity to kind of smooth out the rest of the lines in my sky. I wish I had marked down which marker I'd use to start. You are definitely not it. Usually I do, I swatch them down and write them down that way I've got them for future reference. Nope. Hmm, dilemmas. What did I do? Maybe this one? Well, I don't think so, but we'll have a look here. Hmm, dilemmas, you guys. Dilemmas. Don't want to mess with the sky anymore right now. Um, I think what I might do is scan it at this point and keep it, uh, keep a copy at this stage. And then if I want to rework it, go in again. Because um, doing more with that right now is just going to be a bit of a risk. And I mean, risks are great. That's what art's for. But I don't really want to ruin something that I've been working so diligently on. So we'll add a little bit of the gel pen. Kind of wake up these curves a little bit. The great part about the gel pen is it really sets off the bit of subtle shading that we did in the white part of the clouds. Just making it a bit more obvious. Contrast is your friend. So I think we're coming up on the end of the hour here. We'll put this little bit of white in, and I think we'll call it for today. It was really nice to get back to the stream. I appreciate your patience with me not being able to for the last couple weeks. Sometimes life just gets to be what it is. And as much as I love hanging out, <laughs> you gotta take care of the necessary sometimes. that is good for now okay so I'm gonna go I hope you enjoy the rest of your day I hope you get up to something that is creative it doesn't have to be good it just has to get done and I will see you guys next week all right take care